There are only two teachings that the Buddha lists as categorical, meaning that they're true across the board in all situations for everybody. One is the Four Noble Truths, and the other is the principle that skillful actions should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. In fact, you can derive the Four Noble Truths from that second categorical teaching. Craving should be abandoned, the past should be developed, so as to comprehend suffering and then attain its cessation. So in that case, the craving is the unskillful action and the path is the skillful one. There's a, another passage where one of the Buddha's lay followers is being accosted by some members of another sect, and they ask him, does your teacher teach that the world is eternal or not? No, he, neither one. How about if it's infinite? No, he doesn't address that one either. How about if the soul is the same thing as a body or different? Nope. How about an arahant after death? Does he exist, not exist, both, neither? The Buddha doesn't address any of those. So the person says, your teacher doesn't teach anything. Apparently those were the hot issues of the day. And the only person that said, no, he, there's one thing he teaches, that he teaches skillful actions should be developed and unskillful ones abandoned. That for him was the central teaching, and he went to talk to the Buddha about the conversation, the Buddha affirmed what he'd said. So as we're sitting here meditating, it's important that we have a sense of what we're doing right now, and whether it's skillful, whether it's not, and realizing that we always have the choice. You can either abandon skillful actions or you can develop them. You can abandon unskillful ones or you can develop them. And the Buddha's recommendation, of course, is to develop the skillful ones and abandon the ones that are not. It's happened many times, though, that I've been teaching retreats. It's happened here in the States. It happened recently in France. Well, the question gets posed. This obsession with the minutia of your little actions, isn't that getting in the way of realizing the oneness that's around us all the time? Why have to just let go of questions of right and wrong, and there you are. There's oneness. The question, of course, is what kind of oneness is that? It's an idea, it's a perception, and how reliable is that perception? You can apply oneness to all kinds of things. And as the Buddha pointed out, even the highest state of oneness or non-duality is fabricated. There's the oneness of consciousness, where your sense of your awareness is one with its object. But that's fabricated and it's going to let you down. Even more so, just slapping the label of oneness on everything without really knowing what you're doing. Because after all, there is a choice. You can choose to use that label or not, and you have to ask yourself, why are you using the label? What are you trying to avoid? Because there are a lot of things where dualities really do matter. When you have your brain operated on, you want the surgeon to know which part of your brain is the left brain, which part is the right, which knife to pick up, which white knife not to pick up. And of course, the issue of suffering places a lot of dualities on you right there. Suffering is different from not suffering. And the cause of suffering is different from the cause of not suffering. And unless you're totally dead, you're going to prefer not suffering. So the path forces dualities on us. The fact of suffering forces dualities on us. It all comes down to our actions. And it's not just a minor, picky, uni kind of distinction here. There's something very unusual in the path, which is the principle that your present experience is composed of results of past actions, your current actions, i.e. Your, your current intentions, and the results of your current intentions all fitted together. And it's those 
present actions that take the potential from the past and turn it into what you're actually experiencing right now. Like you're choosing to stay with the breath. The fact that you've chosen to stay with the breath, that changes the breath right there. And if you do it right, there's going to be a sense of ease that comes with the fact that you're paying attention to the breath. The important thing in all of this is that your current actions don't have to be influenced by your past ones. There is some freedom of choice there. How that happens, the Buddha doesn't explain. Where it come from, comes from, he doesn't explain. But it's by pursuing this relative level of freedom you have right now. If you follow it carefully enough and consistently enough, it'll take you to a bigger kind of freedom, i.e. the unconditioned freedom. So these little choices we're making here are not little. We're zeroing in on something that's really important, this potential for freedom right here, right now, and how to make the most of it. Most people don't make the most of their freedom of choice. They just go along with old habits, put everything on automatic pilot, and direct their attention someplace else. But if you really want freedom, you have to turn around and look. What are you choosing right now? Why are you choosing it? What do you expect the results will be? And this was the series of questions that the Buddha posed to his son. And when the Buddha was teaching his son, he wasn't the kind of teacher who would just give elementary but not very insightful lessons to the kids. He wanted to get the kid to start off on the right foot right from the very beginning. So he focused on actions your intentions. What do you expect to happen as a result of your actions? And then you check. Did you actually get the results you wanted? If not, you can go back and change. Keep circling around these choices you have right now. And your sensitivity as to what's skillful and what's not will develop. For instance, the Buddha himself, when he was getting on the right path, divided his thoughts into two kinds, thoughts imbued with sensuality, ill will, harmfulness on one side, and those that were free of sensuality, in other words, dealing with renunciation, free from ill will, free from harmfulness, on the other side. And then he watched his mind. When it's going to the harmful side, he kept it in check. When it's going to the more skillful side, he let it wander as it liked, just to keep an eye on it, though. Make sure it didn't wander too far astray. But he began to realize that you can think skillful thoughts all day long, and there may not be any bad karmic consequences, but it's tiring to the mind. So it's even more skillful to get the mind into concentration. In the various levels of concentration, you find you can get the mind deeper and deeper into concentration. And the level of skill here becomes more refined. You begin to notice that certain perceptions weigh on the mind. Even the perceptions that keep you in concentration can be a weight. You learn to let those go. You know, get deeper and deeper into concentration. As with any skill, you learn to do it more and more efficiently. The quicker at getting the mind to settle down, the more efficient at like getting it to stay there with a minimum amount of effort. But there's always going to be some effort in the concentration. At this point, the Buddha doesn't call it stress or suffering, but there is a very subtle level of stress. He calls it disturbance. And so you circle around that, your choice to focus on one perception rather than another. And there comes a point, though, where it's not just getting into deeper concentration. You begin to realize that the fact that you're making a choice, no matter what the choice is going to be, is going to involve stress of some kind, more or less refined. And if everything is in balance, there comes an opening when you realize there's another alternative which you don't have to make a choice. And in not making the choice, you're freed from the present moment, because it was your present choices that made the present moment. 
That's how you reach the ultimate freedom, unconditioned freedom. So unconditioned freedom is found by f focusing on these choices we have to make, the fact that we have some freedom in choosing our actions. And we want to learn how to be more and more sensitive and more and more skillful around that issue. So it's this conditioned freedom that takes us, as we follow the outfall path, to an unconditioned freedom. One of the questions I was asked in France was whether the unconditioned freedom is what explains conditioned freedom. And their answer has to be no. Unconditioned freedom doesn't cause anything. It's not a foundation or a ground for anything. It's not the source of anything. It's simply that the path takes you there. And it's this path of focusing on the question of what you're going to do right now. Is it skillful or not? That's what takes you to the threshold of that freedom. One person kept pursuing this question again and again. I finally found out why. He'd been listening to a teacher in another tradition who said that you know, unconditioned freedom is the foundation for everything we do right now. It's where everything comes from and where everything returns. And this person observed quite rightly, well, if everything comes from unconditioned freedom, then when you reach unconditioned freedom, what's to prevent things from coming back out again? Particularly, what's to keep you from coming back out again? Is there no once-and-for-all kind of freedom? And if unconditioned freedom was the source of things, there'd be no escape. There'd be no final release from suffering. But here, unconditioned freedom is not the cause of anything at all. It's totally separate from causes. You find it by exploring your present causes. But there's a leap. There's a disconnect. But by pursuing this supposedly minor issue of the fact that you can choose to be skillful in your choices right now or not, actually it takes you something really big. A freedom once and for all, which you can't find any other way. So make the most of the freedom you've got now. And it'll take you to a freedom that's bigger than you can imagine.